welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted the power of ancient wisdom and modern mysticism to help change your life, then do we have the Shaman's Cave show for you. Today I'll be talking with the creator of the new podcast, The Shaman's Cave, repeat guest Sandra Ingerman, author of an all-time favorite book of mine that I literally keep across the room on my shrine, The Book of Ceremony, and Renee Barabo, the author of another all-time favorite book that's helped guide us to Colorado, Winds of Spirit, and we'll be talking about the power of shamanism in the modern world and how to take a shamanic journey. That plus we'll talk about hummingbirds and hawks. Dots and Convertibles, White Buffalo Calf Woman, The Gift to the Prayer Pipe, Four Cycles, Buffaloes, and Bulls, The Wind Spirit, Fate, Blessings, Helpful Spirits, and Carl Jung, and What in the World Talking with Crows has to do with anything. So welcome back to the show, Renee and Sandra. Are you both ready to shine? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Right here with you. <laughs> well, we were we were um, we have a dear friend who passed away eight days ago. We'll probably talk about her and maybe a little ceremony around her in a few minutes. Jessica and I were at the gym this morning watching a sunrise when a um, an, another gentleman came up to us and reminded us the name of this. A murder appeared in the parking lot. A murder of crows. That is. <laughs> and we wondered, what are they trying to tell us that all of these birds congregated in this parking lot at once? So, for both of you, first off, for Renee, how did you get into shamanism? Wow, we go from crows to crows. I, to I think they're the inexplicably I linked. <laughs> you know, truthfully, they are. When um, I remember I was in my 30s and I you know, owned a restaurant and I was redoing a house over in the ghetto. And there was this, when I bought the house, it was fired, burnt out. And there was holes in the attic and it was filled with pigeons. And finally, I mean, after many, 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 I mean, six months of boarding and, you know, getting windows and bracing it, all of a sudden I had finally all the windows on the place and there was a blackbird in my living room. And at the time I didn't know that the blackbird was an omen about death because uh, two weeks later, my father had a massive stroke and three, three, four weeks later, my stepfather dropped dead of a heart attack. And it was only in retrospect that I could start to think about what that blackbird was doing in my, my, my living room, which trust me, getting those pigeons gone was such a chore. <laughs> And I have to think Carla was watching over us. She said when she was gone to the other side, she would be sending us uh, magpies, which is in the, the crow or blackbird family. So I had to think this was a sign from the other side this morning. Absolutely. And so how did you get into shamanism? You know, I was just writing an article and I decided that shamanism got into me with my first wind breath in the uh, in the hospital because Many years later, when I was hiking Canyon de Chez, yeah. I was hiking up this very steep mountain, and all of a sudden, I had this rebirthing experience where I could actually smell the ether in the, the room, and I could feel the greenness. And, and so I decided that I was called to shamanism very, very early in my life. I just didn't know it until I was about in my 30s. But when I look back at all the experiences that added up to there, it made perfect sense. Beautiful. And Sandra, what's been your path? And feel free to chime in on the birds, too. Yeah, well, I'll chime in on the birds, too. I grew up in Brooklyn, and we had unbelievable. We had, you know, one of those houses that I, I lived in starting third grade. I grew up in Coney Island, but then we moved. And my God, all the crows would line up um, on the um, laundry line every day. Oh, cool. And... And so I would sing to them and they would sing back to me. And and really, that's that I didn't even know how deep I was into shamanism as a little girl, because 
I was constantly talking to the crows and they were teaching me how to see and rise above. And, and then I had my near death experiences and mystical experiences. And then that all led me to in 1980 on Halloween, Mm -hmm. taking up my very first workshop on shamanic journeying. And I met up with a helping compassionate spirit who stood and answered all my unanswered questions in life. And I said, yes, because I'd been on this long spiritual journey from birth, but I never knew what to do with it. What do you do with the messages from the crows? What do you do with the messages from the moon? What do you do when you understand oneness and you're a teenager? What do you do when you've seen God in a near-death experience? Somebody needs to give you a foundation of how to proceed. And uh, stepping into the world of shamanism formally through constant initiation experiences led me to a path where I could focus how I work with the messages from the crows and how nature and humans sing back and forth to each other. And I'm so fascinated with learning the language of nature right now, because I think that's what we're missing in our culture. Nature is speaking to us right now. It's singing to us right now, but we don't know its language. And so this is our next step in evolution. (laughs) Beautiful. And we're going to talk more about learning that language today. One of the gentlemen in the gym, I didn't suspect he had a woo-woo part to himself. I love that woo-woo soul. We all have it at some deep level. And he said, have you ever spoken to the crows? And Jessica says, well, yes, not only have we spoken to the crows, but when I first met Michael, we were out on the stoop of a meditation center in Boulder, Colorado, the Shambhala Center, and he was talking to the crows up above me. (laughs) And she goes, at the time, I thought it was kind of weird. She goes, I'm talking with them now, too. They were telling me, she's the one. (laughs) She's the one. And I looked up as I'm talking with her, and I'm like, I know. I know. (laughs) Do we all have these initiation experiences? Yes, we all go through initiation experiences because we're not part of nature. We are nature. And nature is always going through the initiation experience of death and rebirth. And we are nature. And so we're always going through a process of death and rebirth. And the initiations we go through as humans that lead us into spiritual work, whether it's shamanism or meditation or whatever, is to start to sculpt away the ego so that we can embrace the principle of oneness and we move away from our personality that we got through life and through projections And we finally find our authentic self and we can finally shine. What does, for for both of you, maybe we'll go to Renee first. What does it mean to discover your authentic self? Wow. I, you know, for me, it was interesting because I came in pretty much as my authentic self and there was no, there was no way that I was going to be anywhere. My sister used to be embarrassed when I'd go to school with my knee socks because I didn't really care. I was more dressing always for comfort. So for me, there was the authentic self was always there, but then I got disconnected from it probably with enough pushing and pulling from the outside universe. So then I had to find my way back there. But authenticity was always pretty close to my heart. So, and does authenticity, does that mean to, um, is it about not bringing a false self to, to others to portray to the world? Or is it about something deeper on the inside? You know, for first, it was about not presenting any, any, any part of myself that I didn't want to show to the world. But then I had to come over what, what Sandra was calling for the projections or the things with it to get back to that some of those authentic things taken in extreme become 
you know, character flaws and character defects, like I'm going to show you type of things instead of like, this is how I show up in the world and I don't have to explain it. I don't have to change it and, you know, either be with me this way. And that doesn't mean I don't refine. It just means that I'm absolutely okay with the way that I am, blemishes, flaws and all, and let's fine tune it from there. Is that what you mean, Sandra? Well, yeah, for me, um, uh, I, I wrote um, this non this fiction book a long, very long time ago. And the metaphor I used in that book, it's like, imagine uh, being in a studio where clay, uh, where a pot is being formed. And so you keep throwing clay on and you keep throwing clay on and and the essential nature of it starts to get covered up. Mm -hmm. And what I was trying to bring through is this is what happens to us in life, is our parents and society and our friends and our authority figures start throwing clay on us, trying to shape us into this sculpture that covers up when we were this little being looking down on this great earth and going, wow, a planet I can feel, I can taste, I can eat chocolate, I can laugh, I can be angry, I can be sad. And I have a gift. There's something I want to manifest in this lifetime. I'm so excited about mm -hmm. coming here. And so then we come here and our passion, this clay just immediately starts being put on us by others. And all of a sudden, what's my destiny? What's my passion? What brings that light to my eyes, to my heart, to my soul? And that's, that's the authentic self that we're trying to re, um, get in touch with as we allow through initiation experiences the clay to be peeled off the pot mm -hmm. so that our original essence can be seen and felt. Beautiful. This, this leads me in about a dozen different directions, but I have an image of a dog right now, so I'm going to go with it. A big, wet dog. Can we use shamanism to help shake loose all of the extra clay? Um, <clears throat> shamanism uh, will shake loose the extra clay, whether you want it to or not. <laughs> Easy way or the hard way. <laughs> yeah, because when you, shamanism is a spirit led path and it's about your divine self, your spirit, your higher spirit, uh, carrying the love, the energy, the power of the helping spirits. So you become one. And the only way you can become one with the helping spirits and carry their power is to let go of everything that burdens you, that prevents you from standing up strong and being inspirited in life and following your destiny and bringing a unique power quality in the world. So when you enter into the path of shamanism and the helping spirits start to merge with you, they start chiseling. They start chiseling away whether you ask for it or not. You call them in. And this is the only way they can work with you. They have to find your essential self to be able to speak to you. How do we welcome them in? And how do we welcome them in? The expression I like to use based on my couple two by four experiences in life, kind, gentle, easy, good. Oh, that would be nice if it was always kind, easy, and gentle and good. But you know, we, we came into this world where there's all kinds of experiences. And so for some people like myself, who is probably a little more hard headed, some of my experiences weren't always so easy. So like one time I was sitting in a lecture where all of a sudden the, the, the teacher in the front of the room said, hey, I think I'll just do a little rattling. And the next thing I know, I was on a dismemberment journey for the entire hour and my friends literally had to, you know, carry me from the room where I was, you know, taken apart. Something was taken out. I was put back together and sewn shut with arrows. 
So you're going to have to share what this means, the dismemberment experience. With that said, I'm having a vision of an ayahuasca ceremony I had with a shaman years ago. And there's g this giant metallic, I don't know, beast with these giant <laughs> steel teeth. And I'm on a conveyor belt and there's flames behind the teeth. And I'm headed for it for a complete uh, <laughs> saw down. What was your dismemberment experience? What did that look, feel like? What was going on? Well, this, that's a pretty common um, experience with, with shamanic. Uh, the path is that there's some place where everything gets dismembered and gets put back together, hopefully in a, in a way that allows you to be that more authentic self. So they can be a, a death can be a dismemberment experience or a near death experience. But this one was actually where I was actually put on this old Egyptian slab and uh, all my bones and everything were taken apart and I was cut open and there was a, a mass that was taken out from my, um, from my, all the way from my pelvic area up to my top of my solar plexus, it was removed. And then there was this hole that had to be uh, hopefully refilled with the light and of some of the new experiences that I was adding. But as as a human, and, and my upbringing was a little bit more tumultuous, you know, a lot of those experience added into like, like almost a density of material inside that was best to be removed in order for me to, you know, fully engage with the, my path of service. And you were experiencing this because the rattle started, you basically went on a shamanic journey without he was having a lecture. He was talking about long distance healing, but I don't think he meant go back to Egypt. And I mean, it was like a lecture. It wasn't like an experiential workshop. You know, my friend, luckily one of my good friends was sitting there watching like, hey, she's gone, you know, and just kind of was holding space and another one on the other side of me. But it wasn't like when you were lying out on the floor trying to have one of those experiences. It was like a spontaneous healing that happened that day when I was sitting in the room. And he knew it was going to happen because two days earlier, I met this man. I didn't know him on the path. And he said to me, hmm, how old are you? And I'm there like, well, I'm going to be 40. Oh, and he smiles and said, oh, that's when it started happening to me, too. <laughs> wow. And I was trying to chase after her to find out what it was that was going to happen to me. But I found out two days later all on my own. How, how do we do we want to hmm, how do I put this now? It's sounding very intimidating is the best way to put it. What exactly is a shamanic journey? Why is it so important to have these initiations? Sandra, oh. maybe that would be better for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I just want to back up a little bit because please, please. it's actually not intimidating. It sounds intimidating. I can't tell you. I, I have been teaching. I taught 40 workshops a year for 10 years, and that has con you know continued, but not at that pace. So I've had the opportunity to teach thousands and thousands of people how to journey and speak to them right after the journey. It is unbelievable how many people have a full dismemberment experience on their very first shamanic journey. They go into the lower world and ask for a power animal and a bear comes and rips them apart. And so this is such a good thing. And they come up to me and they go, you know, this sounds so weird. And I don't know why I'm saying this to you, but this was the most peaceful wonderful experience of my life. Mm -hmm. And this is what you hear from people. So the reason for the dismemberment and shamanism, and with Renee, it happens spontaneously. And that's the sign of a shaman when it happens spontaneously. When it happens spontaneously to people in my workshops, that's a sign of a shaman. But many of us actually go to seek out dismemberment for healing. So what happens is, um, a force of nature, the yep. wind or an animal or an insect or the sand comes and takes off your body, which uh, is covering up your spirit. Mm -hmm. And then your spirit gets to be one with source again. 
And then once you're one with source again, you come back into your body and the spirits, they lick your bones. They clean all the illness, hurt, trauma out. They um, clean your heart. They might take your heart out and put in a beautiful crystal. Um, and so they put you back together with so much love and so much healing but then you come back understanding, I'm not just this body sitting here. I'm actually connected to source. I am source. And so that's the whole point of a shamanic initiation. Dismemberment is not the only way for an initiation, but um, there are many different ways for initiation. It's just one. And the shamanic journey is one ceremony that shamans perform where the shaman, once they start to lose that attachment to ego personality, can put their personality aside and their soul can fly into the unseen realms where there's this wealth of helping compassionate spirits who want to join with us to give us guidance um, when we're having issues in life or, or to perform healings or like Michael, the people on your show and you and myself and Renee who are going through, so, go through so many life challenges that can be so devastating. The spirits walk with you. They walk with you and they help you gain a new perspective and they help you re-engage in life, and they help you heal. And so they're our allies. And boy, do we need allies right now. Oh, heck yeah. How <laughs> do we call in our allies? How do we call in our spirits, the elders, everyone there to guide, protect, and help us on our path? Renee, do you want to um, start? or? You're just um, so eloquent. I sit there like, oh my God, all those <laughs> teaching all those years and mine like are so like, you know, <laughs> impromptu type of things. But there's a number of ways. Shamans use a lot of different tools to call upon those allies. I can use my wind whistle. Uh, we can use drums. We can use rattles. You use ayahuasca. I mean, there's many, many different ways. You can sing. Uh, you can trance dance. There's, there's this lots and lots of ways to get there and what you know whatever feels more more comfortable or what you've learned in your culture are certainly um one way i mean i started you know with a fire walk to learn how to to to, to feel that move into that energy and then i spent 10 years in a lakota sweat lodge and you know in the ceremony of the dark and the stones and and so that's another way through singing that the allies came they they changed for me. I had many, and Sandra, uh, you you were more aligned with the one the one path that you were on. So you, I'm sure you could tell us about that. Yeah, I um I kind of stayed single pathed. I I experimented a bit, and I, I worked with some shamans from different cultures. But I'm a psychotherapist, and so I was so focused on how do we bring shamanic journeying and ceremony into our modern day culture to deal with our issues at this time. And so I felt more drawn to be spirit led through the process of direct revelation where I allowed the spirits to teach me. Mm -hmm. um, and so in the path that I follow, the drum. Uh, oh, beautiful. This oh here. my God. This has <laughs> the most amazing intertwined, probably infinite loop in a sense, serpent on this magnificent, it's a narrow, <laughs> but giant diameter, so <laughs> though not that thick, but giant diameter, uh, looks like natural hide drum. Yeah, so you you um, you hit the drum, and I don't want to drum too loud because we don't know the sound levels, but the drumming uh, changes your brain waves, and it takes you out of that ordinary state of consciousness into what we call a theta state of consciousness. Uh, your brain waves go into a theta state. They slow down. And once uh, your brain slows down into a theta state, it creates this amazing um, doorway 
to take you into the invisible realm. So in the Siberian culture, the drum is called the horse that takes the shaman on his or her journey. And so in the practice that I use, the drum is the vehicle, the snake, the animal that takes us onto the journey. But I also journey drinking tea. Mm -hmm. I can get into that theta state in the morning. And I love to journey sitting in nature. Um, nature really raised me. And so it, it really is about um, sitting and getting still. And then those beautiful spirits come to us and the visions and the healing and the energy starts to flow. I never thought of it this way, but each morning, it's a program that I've taught people for years. I teach people automatic writing, and each morning, I listen to theta brain entrainment music before calling in the spirits and writing. And I've never thought of that as a shamanic journey until this moment. <laughs> yes, actually, we work in a very similar way. Um, I actually have worked uh, teaching fundamentalist Christians how to get in touch with a shamanic so cool. state. And how I do that is um, through playing music mm -hmm. that is known to put people into a theta state and teaching automatic writing. And uh, it all comes through. It's really, anybody can do it. And so I like to teach diverse populations by not trying to put, not trying to push any population away because shamanism is a way of life. It's a way of living life through beauty and through being conscious. And if people don't relate to the drum or to the helping spirits, there's so much of shamanism that we can engage in that helps to heal us and the planet. And so why push people away? Um, for me, it's I find the language, I find the tools where I can bring everybody into a ceremony. And it looks like a shamanic ceremony when it's done. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. So from there, for both of you, um, this might get at the core of everything because it's what we're connecting with. What is the language of nature? Well, that's what we're trying to learn right now. <laughs> you know, I think what's happening, I am reflecting so much on this, is shamans used incantations because shamans are gardeners of energy. They're gardeners of energy. They only work with energy. That's all they do. And what they do is through their chants, they sing the songs of creation that are part of their culture and that manifest healthy forms. That's how they heal and that's how they create healthy forms. They go into illness and uh, through their chanting and through calling in the creative spirits, whatever's going, the energy is reformed in your body. But what's happened in our culture is we're into the English language and we're into the thinking mind. And so we don't know how to open our hearts because nature will teach us the language. And so we're all on this journey together, learning the language of the earth and learning the language of nature. I'm with you too. I'm, I'm learning too. <laughs> and that's why I think that the, um, the wind book came through now, you know, winds of spirit, because it looks like that Pat, about 10,000 plus years ago, people understood how to listen to the wind. And then somehow when we moved from the countryside into the city and we moved from outside to the inside doing our prayers, uh, we weren't, we, we started to hear that we needed somebody else to tell us how to hear that message that the person standing in the front of the room was going to interpret those signs for us instead of, when you used to live out on the tundra or you lived out in the farm, you needed to be able to tell the subtle differences like, oh, the wind's just about right. I need to put my seeds into the earth. And so we got lost. We lost our way. And then for the last 30 or 40 years, you know, people who have been studying, you know, the ancient shaman practices have been trying to carve out that road back there so that other people probably would be able to start to hear the messages too. 
And right now I'm with you. Um, Sandra mentioned something about getting to know one tree this year. So I've been getting to know the tree out like right around the corner on my walk every night. And, and boy, that's an interesting experience to get into just meeting one tree along the way. Well, I love it. We were this morning, Jessica and I were watching the birds. We have all these birds for this year in summertime. We had thousands, literally thousands of hummingbirds here. They've gone south, but they've been replaced. Animals find us. They kind of seek us out for whatever reason. Deer, elk uh, uh, are almost daily companions here and all the birds. And different birds started appearing last night, some yellow-headed birds and red-headed birds. And we had a guest on the show talking about our, our lost connection with the earth and about how in the old days, and it's something we, we get to get back to, you knew what bird came in at which time of year, which song was which bird, which flower bloomed when, what the stories were of your hill, of your valley, of your mountain. There's an importance to getting back to that, to getting to know our land, even if it's the city land, getting to know what's going on on our plot of land, isn't there? Absolutely. Um, I, I, I grew up in Brooklyn and I lived in San Francisco, but for the last 35 years, I've had the blessing to live in Santa Fe and be in nature. And I know exactly the change in seasons that's going to happen by the birds coming in. Yeah. And I know when the weather is going to change, when a storm is coming in, because the birds will not only change their behavior, but other certain birds will come in. Mm -hmm. So I will, I will disagree with any uh, meteorologist on TV <laughs> because I'm watching the birds. <laughs> and, um, and, it's very important. I used to teach with a Native American elder who was part Lakota Sioux, and her ability, because uh, she lived out in nature by herself for so many years, her uh, observant ability, we would sit at workshops and to listen, uh, the richness of life that she brought through in her stories, we would just be sitting there like that. And it was her life in this little part of nature and the wealth that we would all do anything to get that she got by sitting in her spot in nature for years. Um, there's a wealth that comes to it because we're in deeper relationship. We're out of a superficial way of living life. And I think we're looking for a deeper relationship. And nature is our greatest teacher because nature, it's authentic. <laughs> and nature, nature is, is, I don't know if we want to call it supra mind, but it's, it's beyond words. You go for in two instances. I can remember when I first stepped to the foot of the Grand Canyon and I'm like, I've seen a lot of nature and I'm just bawling, just the tears. Mm -hmm. It's such an <laughs> awe that it's without, the only thing that I can, I can correlate is when I move past this world and I've been there many, many times before, that's the grandeur that I'm getting a hint at by seeing the Grand Canyon, but it's beyond words. In fact, it's, it's something you talk about in your book, Sandra, it is seeing through our hearts or opening portals with our hearts. What does that mean? Well, shamans, uh, there's an understanding. When the main teaching of shamanism is shamans uh, see through their hearts, not through their eyes. And so what happens is, is when you teach people shamanic journeying, they're trying to see these visions and images like TV. But when we open our hearts and we embrace nature, we feel the tree in our body. We don't, it's not in our mind. It's, it's a body experience, a cellular experience. And so we step into another part of ourselves. Nature can help us, um, teach us how to step into the deepest parts of ourselves. And it's just through opening our hearts. If you open your hearts, 
the helping, compassionate spirits will come to you. You don't have to journey. You don't have to take a class. If you open your heart, nature will talk to you. The helping spirits will talk to you. The unseen realms will come to anybody with an open heart. We see almost every day, it just started this past week, we see uh, an eagle as we head out from our home and back when we come home. When we see a majestic creature or any creature, large and small, and we want to connect with them to say, why am I seeing you, eagle? Why are you here on my path each and every day at the moment? Beyond the fact that, chirp, I probably got a nest over here, but <laughs> she's letting herself be seen. What do we do? Hmm. For me, I, I have a cabin up on Whidbey Island, and when, that, when the eagles squeak, because yes. it sounds like oh. a little squeak, these huge birds make these little tiny squeaks. I get up from my writing or whatever I'm doing and run out of the cabin each and every time. And so for me, the experience is I get back, back to childlike joy and innocence in the sound of that ego. And, you know, it becomes a thing where when you're trying to write a book, it's a little difficult that every time you hear an ego squeak, you run out the door and, and stop. But maybe it, it was a break I needed. So sometimes I think just coming back to being present in my life is all that the animal is asking me to do in that moment because it's only from that place can I really experience that open heartedness that Sandra was talking about. I, I went through um, an incredibly challenging time, which I, I won't go into in the last four years. And, uh, and at the right moment, this little baby bunny that lived on the property oh, so cool. would hop onto the uh, onto the lawn when I would say to the universe, please give me a sign that I'm going to get better or please give me a sign that something's going to be good. So baby bunny would keep coming and then baby bunny disappeared. I mean, disappeared. And a year later, I was, I was having, you know, I was still um, in a crisis. And I said, if, if baby bunny would just come. <laughs> and after a year, baby bunny came out, it was no longer a baby and sat on the lawn. And then just a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to my husband and I was saying, God, if baby bunny would show <laughs> up, it would just show us that we're, this is right. What we're going to do is right. And guess what happened? Baby bunny, who's now an adult, walks right onto the lawn. <laughs> so animals show up oftentimes when we need messages. If my husband and I, we both have the same omen that shows up. If we're a little bit nervous about taking a trip or going on a big adventure, Hawk always will either fly over our car or come and land right in our tree, say, you're good. And we have no questions. If we see Hawk, the decision is made. It's done. For people who are listening who are going, ah, oh, this is coincidence, or that may happen with you, how do we begin to step forward into this communication? For me, I... I think that the, the first thing we have to do is start to just be willing to be willing. And in that willingness, then say, well, okay, I'm going to just take a, a, a gander. Like I used to, I used to always, I've always known things. I'm not a big seer or whatever, but I know things. And a friend used to tell me, write it down on a white card and put it in your file box. And so then, you know, it came a joke for years because I never really had the white cards in the file box, but to say like, Oh, yeah, I put that in my white card in the file box, just so that we start to even start to have a relationship with that. This might be something that I could pay attention to. That's worked for me. Yeah. And what works for me is I go out into nature and I hold a question like um, uh, I'm asking for a sign. Uh if I uh, should say yes to Renee about um, doing the shaman's cave together, and then I'm walking down the path and uh, it's cloudy and all of a sudden the sun comes out and I notice that, I'm observant to that. And I walk a little bit more and then a hummingbird comes and mm -hmm. sits on my. So what I suggest to people is, is you take what, what we call it in shamanism, a divination walk. 
you come up with a question. What's a question? What's your intention? What do you want to know? And then you go to your city park or you go out into nature, wherever you are. I did this in Brooklyn. I took clients in San Francisco on divination walks. Doesn't matter where you live. And then you watch, you notice what's happening with the clouds, what animals start to show up. And then if you're persistent and you keep working in this way over weeks or months, it's through time you notice a pattern that nature starts to show a pattern of how it communicates to you. And that's how my husband and I learned to trust Hawk is every time we got scared about taking a trip, Hawk crossed our car mm-hmm. every time. So you learn. That's how you learn. You're you're holding a question and an animal keeps showing or the, the clouds keep parting or the wind comes and brushes you on the cheek saying, yes, you learn over time that these are the beings that are going to keep informing you of your next steps. Beautiful. On those notes, and I'm, I'm thinking back to that first shamanic journey I had. And actually, we saw a double rainbow as we were mm-hmm. on our way to, to meet with the shaman. Um, each morning when the sun rises, I call myself a sun gazer, and I'm not recommending it to anybody staring at the sun. It's, it's a little piece of a practice that I do safely. Um, but I am sharing gratitude with the sun, and I feel that changes everything. What is the power of the tool of gratitude as a shamanic tool? It's everything. You know, in the, in, when I, in the Lakota way, when I did a hembleche for three days and three nights, I didn't even realize, I used to sit in these lodges and think, I don't know how to pray. I don't know how to pray. And then after after my my vision quest, I walked down the mountain and I got lost because of my impatience or whatever. And I, I was lost nine, 12 miles after not drinking water for days and not having any food. And all of a sudden I was in front of a spigot and I was probably thirsty, but it was the first time in my life I understood having reverence for water. You know, I, I just took like like a little drop and put it on my kerchief and I just dabbled it all over. And I was like, I was like, I, I understood awe for the first time in my life. And, and it took many years to get there. And after that, I didn't, I knew how to pray because I understood. So if you don't know how to pray, just keep going. And Sandra? Yeah, gratitude is the core of of shamanism. But again, gratitude needs to come from the heart. And sometimes we can do rote ceremonies. You know, we go out in the morning with our cup of tea or coffee and we go, oh, thank you, son. Um, And when you learn real reverence, real honor, reciprocal, everything in shamanism is about gratitude, but about reciprocity. And so when we start our day by saying, I am grateful for my life, no matter what's happening, you started with that incantation that starts a vibration that starts to weave uh, a beautiful day for you. If you start with, oh, God, another day, I can't face another day, that's the incantation. That's the vibration you put out into the universe, and that's how your day is woven together. And so gratitude helps to um, bring in the goodness of life. It helps to bring in the goodness of life. Very briefly, I can't tell the whole story, but a family that had to run for their lives, um, they they couldn't find water. And so they came to a river with dead bodies and blood. And they were so grateful for water. They drank it. They were so grateful that nobody got sick. 
And they said, thank you. When we needed water, there was water. And when they were hungry, they came to a rice field filled with dirt. The rice was so dirty. And what all they saw was food, beautiful food. And they were so grateful for it. And when they ate it, it healed them and it gave them life and nobody got sick. What a lesson. I mean, what a lesson about gratitude when 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 it's coming from the deepest place of your soul, the universe responds. It's a reciprocal relationship. Thank you. Speaking of that, then, and speaking of it, what I'm hearing is is a vibration of gratitude, a raising up. Can you tell us both about the power of blessing? As a chef, you know, that would be my, my experience of where that when you cook, that you just are in relationship to the onions and the carrots and the celery, and then you bless them. Yeah. And then when you chop them and you cook them well, people feel healed. And I think that's kind of what you, you were saying with that whole thing. Like I tell people all the time, like if you're going to eat an ice cream sundae, you do it with a smile on your face. Don't be thinking like, oh my God, I shouldn't be putting this into my body. Oh, I'm going to love up this ice cream sundae with all of my heart. And I'm going to bless the fact that I have an ice cream right in front of me, because I, I think that even if you're you don't have access to really great food, like what you said, that you can you can bless the food that you have, and then it, it's going to raise the vibration of that food that you're putting into your body each and every time. I, I'd like to add something to that because I've been doing that, like many of us have been doing for so many years. And what I've started to do is before I bless my food, first I ask permission of it. Is it okay for me to um, eat you? And I thank it for the life that it's willing to give. And I ask them if it's willing to reveal its program of what power and healing it carries so that when I take it in, it's not, I'm um, saying this soup is good for, I ask the, um, the soup to release its program, its program mm. of healing. And then through my blessings, blessing is a thank you. And, and blessing is a way where we cook or where we do at our activities with love and, and honor. And when we infuse our food with the blessing of love, we feed our body <laughs> and our soul I'm, and our presence. Ooh, beautiful. Mm. I'm, I'm looking over at an altar, and I'm going to ask you about it in a minute. I only have, I guess I have two stones, a little Buddha, a, um, what do you call it, Tibetan uh, singing bowl, and a book, <laughs> a book on ceremony. Actually, I don't know whose book that would be. That's my altar. What does it mean? And, and I want to ask about that in a minute. To live life in ceremony, because the way you're talking about eating right now, for both of you, preparing the food through eating, that is ceremony. That is absolutely a ceremony. Uh, um, when we get up and we greet the sun from an authentic self, that's a ceremony. You know, when we do it not from personality, but we step into our highest self and our heart, that's a ceremony. When we prepare food, that's a ceremony. Um, when we wash our face and we put on our clothes, we can do that in a ceremonial way. Ceremony is a sacred act. Ceremony is a sacred act. That's what ceremony is. And so when we bring sacredness into washing our face, brushing our teeth, cooking, walking in nature, that's a ceremony because uh, we, we change the, the space that we're working into a place of sacredness. And for me, when I'm... Um when I was um, in Peru and studying some of the Quechua ways, you know, they'd carry around rocks. And I thought like, wow, how am I going to travel around the world with all of these rocks? <laughs> right. There you go. And so one thing that I was taught by, by the wind and through the other elements was that I become the altar. 
that living my life in in a blessed way and present, I become the author. And then these other things are pretty much for my self amusement or to remind me that I'm living my life in relationship to spirit all the time. And so, you know, I look up and I can see Ganesh. Oh, that reminds me that obstacles are being removed from my life constantly or, you know, my wind whistle or those are just the, the reminders. How do you make ceremony with the wind? Oh, the wind has its way with me more than I have a way with it, but that's okay. I, I What I do is I, I've learned to call to the winds yeah. and created You're holding this up a wind whistle. Yeah. This is the new wind whistle, yes. I uh, Somebody wanted one without the Aztec face on it for his traditions, and so I made one, and I really like it. Uh, so I've learned that I can call to the wind, and the wind will come and, and be with me in in a you know, in a moment, in a week, I, I like to work with one wind. I don't like to call a new wind every day because life can become really windy. And, um, and I, I create a sacred space, no different than another sacred space, whether I could, I can use fire and the wind, or I can use the drum and the wind, you know, it's not like, like Sandra said, we're all nature. So there is no separation between me and the wind. Would you mind, and, and since you've already probably called in the wind this week, I don't want to call in too much, Min, but would you mind <laughs> calling in the wind to guide us? Sure. So the wind that I'm working with this, this week, and it's, it's nice because you've got your mala beads on, is Bayou, um, the Vedic wind. And they say once you understand Bayou, you have a front row seat to the universe. Beautiful. Mm. So let's, let's since... We're here. Let's call upon Bayou. All right. I immediately saw Vayu on, on his on his deer and as a reminder that it's really time that we step lightly and walk in peace this week that you know that it's time for us to come back into the peace, peacefulness of ourselves mm. beautiful mm. I think we could all all use that well since there's some wrap-up questions I'm going to ask and I want everybody to be able to find your websites but before we do this, I mentioned beforehand that uh, a dear, dear friend, uh, Carla Solberg, a dear friend of ours, um, passed away last week. And, and, and I'm thinking of, I don't know, I'm sending so much love. I'm sending so many prayers for her. I know it wasn't, it was a fast end, relatively speaking, five days after a very long sustained illness. Um, so I'm confident she did make it over to the other side. Mm -hmm. But is there blessings, prayers, ceremonies that would be appropriate for a loved one passing on, and in this case, specifically for Carla? Well, um, I like to work with uh, uh, honorable closure. Mm -hmm. Honorable closure is very important, where you pray for Carla, but at some point you say, Carla, it's time for you to do your journey, and it's time for me to do my journey here. So the ceremony that I love to lead for this is, and we'll do it now for Carla. Um, shamans are what are called psychopomps. Uh, they guide souls um, to heaven or to the next place, whatever you believe in, to the transcendent uh, realms. 
And that's a very serious practice, but there's a very simple practice that we can all do, and we'll do that now. And so we go into our hearts, and Renee and I don't know Carla, but we, we, our hearts are open, and we'll say something. But Michael, I wonder if you would start with just um, something you loved about Carla, a memory, something you just loved about Carla. The most amazing Buddha-like laugh. I called it her Buddha laugh. Mm -hmm. And and it started out off as, as, a, as a, a cackly thing and then just had this mm -hmm. deep Buddha love for everything that would come out. Mm. And so, Carla, I would like to say to you, thank you so much for gracing this earth with your amazing presence. You brought so much to the earth. And I now wish you a beautiful journey home. And Renee, if you would just say a sentence, we'll do something to help Carla in her journey home. Thank you, Carla, for being such a light on this planet, for showing up fully embodied and present and for, for lighting up Michael's heart the way you did. Mm. So, um, Michael, I'm going to rattle, <laughs> and I want you to connect with Carla. And as you connect with Carla, I want you physically, I want to see you lift your arms all the way up to the sky, wishing Carla the most beautiful, graceful journey home. And when your arms come down, I will stop the rattle, and the work will be done. Mm. Thank you. So I lead the ceremony for people, for animals, for trees, for plants. Um, I have a plant graveyard, and I bring my plants, and I do this ceremony uh, for people who lost a lot of trees. Um, we do this ceremony to lift, lift up, to lift up. Whenever I see an animal that's passed on um, out in the open, in particular on a road or wherever, I'll come, scoop them up, park the car, park the bike, scoop them up as long as it's safe, and and bring them over to under a tree, under a bush, someplace what I consider a more blessed place. Everything is blessed, mm -hmm. but, but you get what I'm saying. And then I will say a prayer for them, and um, then I will wave my hand in an upward spiraling motion mm -hmm. and say, be free, be yeah. free, be free, <laughs> always spiraling upwards to help them upwards, similar motion to what you're talking about. That's beautiful. And so I'm sorry, Michael, I forgot to ask you, how did that feel to feel? Tingly, warm. <laughs> Touching her up there, <laughs> giving her a big hug or getting a big hug. But there was warm tinglies. And um, I don't know that the light outside changed at all, but it felt brighter and lighter during this experience, much brighter and lighter. Mm. So, so I, I wanted to say at the end of it, woohoo! <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you know, I do this with all kinds of populations where I just give people uh, a few sentences because otherwise it goes on forever, and then I drum, and everybody lifts up until they're done, and that brings the honorable closure. Mm -hmm. We say thank you. You are now free, and I am now free to live my life but your memory will always be alive. Thank you. Thank That's you. awesome. I did something like that at the treatment center. We had lost somebody over a weekend, Friday to Monday, and everyone was like lost. I gathered everyone. I got the wind whistle, put them all in a circle. And the patients for the first time felt some closure 
on something, you know, that they that that, that you could celebrate life in a, a way with ritual and ceremony. It's a beautiful thing to do. Would it be good to have our own wind whistle or drums or rattle to have our own ceremony or blessings that we can use and do on a daily basis? From a shamanic po- <laughs> yeah, <laughs> from a shamanic point of view, our um, tools that we use are actually alive, and they're our allies. And so, I worked with a, a shaman from the Uchi tradition. He was ninety-four years old, and we were so excited about him coming to lead uh, these ceremonies. But before every ceremony, he had to ask his drum if it felt like working because they were partners. And so what I try to explain to people, my rattles, my drum, they're my friends. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're my allies. They're my partners in my spiritual practice. I love them. I feed them. I rub cornmeal on them. I I sing to them. I talk to them. Um, So if if you can make uh, something simple, um, or if you need to buy a drummer rattle, um, bless it, make it your own, and then make it your best friend, because it actually works with you in partnership. It's not a thing you're using. It's you're doing this together. It's alive. Thank you, and uh, mm-hmm. Renee. Well, we had this uh, a talk in the, the Wind Clan one day about naming your wind whistle and finding out the work that it was going to do with you. One of the nice things about the wind whistle that I like per se is that it brings you centered. It brings you into yourself, like by the act of the breathing. So uh, it's, a, it's a really good tool for bringing you back home into your body because no matter what your relationships are and all the journey you might do, you still chose to come to this planet and body this body for this human experience, which is just like this awesome thing. Like when you started, you get to eat, you get to all these things, you get to have your heart broken and this will bring you home. I love it. Home to yourself. So what would you recommend? Jessica always wants me to ask, what would both of you recommend to help kids on their journey? Mm -hmm. I love to work with children and I I love to teach children how to uh, journey. I think a very simple thing that uh, we can do is to help children keep the doors open between um, the ordinary and non-ordinary realms because kids are journeying all the time. Mm -hmm. So we want to talk to them about the fairies they see and taking them out to the trees and maybe shaking a rattle and let's dance our animal. What animal would you like to dance? And then um, I actually teach children as soon as they can talk how to journey. I drum for a minute or two and they talk for an hour afterwards. I tell them (laughs) Uh, to imagine themselves going down a hole in the ground and there's going to be an animal friend who's going to talk to them and help them with their problems. They come back after a minute and, and tell me all these amazing things. Children are naturals, but what's happening is they're getting into their devices and into the media too quickly and the doors are shutting. And so we want to keep the doors open. That's that's the most important thing. You said that Renee, beautifully. Do you, do you work with kids? I, I do. I, a lot of kids that I'm working with is I'm, uh, in my coaching practice. A lot of my clients are of the childbearing ages. So I get to like, you know, I send books to them. I, you know, I send the kids wind whistles. I mean, I, I get through the parents to the children and make sure that they keep these spiritual practices alive for the next generation. Because that's one of my big concerns is that, so we've moved out of the churches and, you know, where, how are we teaching our children ceremony and rituals? Because whether you agree with the way the church did it or not, it was a practice that people got into. And so I really encourage all of, all of the people that I work with to offer some sort of consistent spiritual practice with their children. 
Awesome. I was going to ask, and I still I am going to ask for for uh, Sandra maybe to lead us in just a minute of this this child children's mini journey with her <laughs> drum at the end, and maybe we get some wind whistle in there. You just brought up. I'm not sure if I heard you wrong or not, but we had a miscarriage this fall, and I heard you say childbearing, and I just want to throw this out to you. First thoughts on either of your minds for us going through a. Um, uh, setting out on this pregnancy journey again, or not, we're not pregnant yet, setting out toward this pregnancy journey again. Mm. I think for personally, I think enjoy the journey. You know, we, <laughs> so many people get into this pregnancy thing and it's like, oh my God, I got to get this yeah, done. Yeah, yeah. Well, good, but enjoy what the whole point was about it. And also to understand that these souls needed a touch in. They just yeah. needed to touch in for a second. And how great of you to give that blessing to another soul that could connect into this earth plane for an instant and move on. So that, you know, give yourself that gratitude and that acknowledgement as well. Thank you. And Sandra? Yeah, I I definitely I feel that with miscarriage, it's it's a being that just as Renee so brilliantly put, just needed a touch in. And it, but it's important to allow yourself and, and have that time to grieve mm -hmm. um, uh, because it was a huge loss for you and Jessica. And then to um, in your sacred space, whether it's in nature and the beautiful woods that you live in or by your altar to call in, just like you call in a helping spirit, you call in the being who would like to come through both of you and uh, who would like you to be their, your, its parent. And I got some chills. Yeah. And call Coming it in soon through, through intention. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Then before we do a quick wrap up, um, Sandra, since you have got you on, on the line, so to speak, first, where can people go to find your beautiful books, your work, and find out more? So um, you can go to sandraingerman.com, S-A-N-D-R-A-I-N-G-E-R-M-A-N.com. There's also a link on my site to shamanicteachers.com which has all the practitioners and shamanic teachers I've trained who I really believe in. So if you'd like to find somebody locally in your area, that's a great resource. Fantastic. And Renee, for you as well? Well, let me first say that we have a combined website now for our new podcast hey. called, and it's very easy to remember, the shamanscave.com or also shamanstv.com. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then if you want to find uh, my stuff, this is Wins the Spirit. And keep it up at the top of Amazon, please. And my website is thepracticalshaman.com. Because as you can tell, I'm very practical. <laughs> and Shamans TV, uh, Shamans, S-A-M-A-N-A-S TV.com has the schedule of our next program and we'll have all the announcements about our upcoming programs. And of course, Michael will be talking about you and Inspire Nation. Beautiful, beautiful. What is uh, the mission, the goal, the hope, the journey behind Shamans TV and the Shamans Cave? Well, we're hoping it, it, it's a 30 minute show. And so what we're hoping to do is to keep people really inspired. Don't give up during this time. Keep people inspired. Renee and I have, we're so different, but we just love what each other shares. And we'll bring practices and ceremonies um, to everybody to engage in over the time to come. So it's a place where we can join together to do spiritual work together in these times. Beautiful. Any last words of wisdom before we do a, a little uh, uh, journey here together? I just think you're awesome. You Aww. are such a light and you add so much brightness to that forest behind you and all the people who get to hear you. And, and I just want to honor you and, and say thank you. It goes both ways, Renee. Thank you so, 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 so much.
Thank you. And thank you, Sandra, too. So it's, it's like a, I'll be a in three there with way a of love hug. here. <laughs> the first time I read your story and I was like, oh, my God, I can't wait to talk to Michael. You're a beautiful soul and <laughs> and blessings to you and Jessica on this on this journey. Um, you're doing important work and. I, I really bless you that you be happy in the process of it and have the joy that you want in your life. He's going to cry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Tears of joy and laughter and potpourri. <laughs> Thank you guys so, so much. Thank you so, so much. All right, I'm I'm touched beyond words. Would you mind leading us in a little um, little journey here? This is my honor. <laughs> I don't think you know this, uh, Sandra, but my drum has a snake on it too. I'll have to show you. Oh, great, fun. So we close our eyes and we take a deep breath, and we step into nature with our heart, with our imagination. And we find an opening into the earth. It could be a hole in the ground. Or maybe there's a tree trunk and you want to climb down the roots. Or there's a body of water you can jump into. Use your imagination. See what shows itself and enter into that opening knowing it's just a transition into the light, into a place in the lower world where there's great beauty and love. You follow out into the light and you call to a helping, compassionate spirit. It might be an animal, an insect, a plant, a tree, an elf, a fairy, a mystical being, maybe one of your ancestors. Notice who shows up and ask that helping spirit if it has a message for you right now because it just loves you. It wants to support you. It's right at your back. Is there a message of love or wisdom or guidance it wishes to share right now? Open up your heart because you might not see the animal. You might feel it. You might hear it. You might hear or feel the messages. And in the best way that you can, let this amazing being, helping spirit, know that you will return to visit it. But in the meantime, ask it if it will lend you its protective help. Thank it for introducing you to the beauty of the unseen realms and feel awe and wonder and excitement about learning from it over time. But for now, it's time to retrace your steps, coming back, climbing up through that tunnel. It's so easy because it's done with spirit. You're flying as spirit back into the room of your home. The work is done for now. Put your hands on your heart and open your eyes. And we are back feeling completely grounded, knowing that we can return again and again and have more time to be with this being that loves us. <laughs> Thank you both so much. This has been such, I have no other way to put it, a journey and a treat here today. <laughs> it, it has been an incredible treat with blessings and blessings to everybody watching and listening. So and thank much. you, Michael, and thank you, Renee. Thank you. Thank both. you both. Thank you so much. So we've got to crank it up here for the finish. So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, 
have fun. Check out the Shaman's Cave and shamanstv.com and begin your shamanic journeying and sacred ceremonies today and shine bright. Woohoo! Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>